Welcome along to our Know My Faith Monday podcast. My guest today is Zoha Gonen. Zoha, shalom. Kia ora. Shalom. How are you? I'm all right. How's your Maori? Not too good yet. Not <laughs> working on it. Working, working on it. progress. <laughs> all right. You've been in the country, what is it, uh, 11, 12 years now? It's going to be 12 years in, in February, actually. All right, just just before we, because we want to get into some teaching today, uh, and we, we're going to take a look at Psalm 8, but uh, just take us on the journey that got Zohar gone into Dunedin. Oh, dear. Um, so we came to Hawke's Bay first and foremost. And in Hawke's no, Bay... Even before New Zealand. You, I mean, your family oh. came to Israel. Oh, oh. It was uh, just a little fellow, four... Um, my family, we moved back from the USSR, from the Soviet Union, yep. to Israel. And we actually were very um, blessed that we were allowed to go out at that time in 1975. And uh, actually, there was a little incident with my mom. She, she wasn't allowed to leave the Soviet Union. Okay. She was a kindergarten teacher. And they decided that she has to stay. But the rest of us, we can go. Oh, <laughs> why obviously, not split the family up? Yeah. Obviously, we wouldn't leave mom behind. So uh, my dad uh, got some kind of uh, enormous guts. And he went and uh, rang from a public phone to the Ministry of Internal Affairs in the Soviet Union in Ukraine. And he said that this is inspector so and so speaking. And they understood he was an officer in the KGB. <laughs> For some reason, uh, they kind of uh, swallowed it. Yeah. And he said, why don't you let citizen so and so leave the country? And she, got, she was granted permission immediately to leave. All right. So this is 1974. Yep. Yep. 1975. So you made, made Aliyah. Yeah, Aliyah. That's, that's right. That's when Jewish people immigrate to Israel. It's called Aliyah. Yeah, coming uh, coming back to the land. Is it, uh, what's yeah. the translation of that? It's actually an ascension. You, ascension. You, yeah, it's like Aliyah. Um, in the back in the days, you would go up to Jerusalem. Come, let yeah. us go up to Jerusalem to the mountain of the Lord. So that's uh, that's Aliyah. You. you you uh, doing an ascension. Yeah, and pretty much, I mean, I remember when uh, Sharon and I were in Israel, from from everywhere, you're always going up to Jerusalem. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, that doesn't matter where you're from. <laughs> Even if you're uh, living higher than Jerusalem, you have to go yeah. down. You've got to go down and, and then yeah. come back up to Jerusalem. Uh, so, what again, what took you from Israel to, to New Zealand? How did you get here? So... At some stage after the army, I came to pay uh, in Yeshua. And a um, few years down the track, I met my wife in the congregation back in Israel. Got married. Um, life um, tackled us mm -hmm. um, in Israel. And it's not always uh, an easy um, going life. But I was working as an engineer in a telecommunication company and and um, things were okay. It wasn't too bad, but I felt there wasn't something more to life than just going to work and not seeing my children until very yeah. night. Yeah. So, so I, I thought maybe um, God is calling me to full-time ministry. And we really started feeling this enormous sensation that um, I wanted to know more and I wanted to deepen my understanding in scripture. And so we started contemplating on going to a Bible college and um, lo and behold, New Zealand came on the horizon at that very time. And so we started uh, looking everywhere uh, that they in any country that speak English, uh, but New Zealand was like um, keep coming popping up. Yeah. So, so you you found a Bible college in New Zealand that could yes. teach a Messianic Jew about his faith. 
Uh, well, that's the thing. You, <laughs> you don't always... Um, okay, there, let's say there are some very strong um, understandings that a Messianic Jew has and some very, very um, solid understandings that the Bible College doesn't always can add on to that. Yeah. But having said that, um, there are still gaps uh, that a Messianic Jew wouldn't know. Um, for example, church history. I wouldn't have a clue um, right. how it looks like, what happened. Neither do the rest of us, so don't forget. <laughs> um, no, first the, just, first just, there was Jesus, and then Martin Luther did something, and now we're all here, you know. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, but... Uh, but yeah, there's there were some 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 gaps that you don't you don't um, really get exposed to growing yeah. up in Israel. So. Yeah. So what I mean, you you now dig really deep into the scriptures and you teach on that as well. What what right. brought that about? Was it just from Zohar's personal hunger? Oh, actually, um, yes. Uh, that's one aspect of it. I think the most uh, significant aspect is when. Uh, when a person is uh, actively sharing the gospel, especially with Jewish people, uh, there are a lot of questions that are popping up. And yeah. uh, with these questions, you start uh, digging deeper into the scriptures to come up with the answers. And so many of my Bible um, teachings are stem from um, from just the experience of sharing the gospel and and uh, encountering questions that yeah. needed some answers. So when you say scriptures in this instance, because I know that, that your heart is towards uh, your own people to introduce them to Yeshua. Oh, so yeah. when you say digging into the scriptures, you're meaning the Tanakh, the Old Testament scriptures. Mainly the Old Testament. Um, uh, this is, uh, um, of course, the foundation for the New Testament. Yeah. But um, you'll be surprised how many young Israelis um, would be open and very much uh, curious about the New Testament because the New Testament is a novelty to them. And yes. uh, so it has to be both ways. And if you, if you do find something in the Old Testament, um, like a really hidden truth, it always has to be yeah. somehow backed up with the New Testament. Yeah, yes. we. I mean, we were just talking before. Uh, let me just hold this up to this camera. This this book mm -hmm. by uh, Roger Levy, the Messiah in the Temple. Yes. And um, it's. I mean, that's a that's a thick book, but that's <laughs> just looking at the temple and how, uh, you know, the old saying that we used to have was. Um, talking about the New Testament and the Old Testament, the new is in the old concealed and the old is in the new revealed. Yes. And I love delving into books like this to, to find my Messiah, my Jesus in the Old Testament, in the temple. Oh, you know, very, and and, and I'm, I'm assuming that I can find him in the columns in the yeah. temple as well. I think it's very, very important that connection, especially in regards to even prophecies from the Old Testament, how they are revealed in both now in, in now day and age, uh, in the life of Jesus, yep. that came after the Old Testament was sealed. And, um, and this component is so important to the faith of, of um, Christians, of born again believers, especially the young people. I think one of the reasons why the people um, you see um, many young people just walk away is because we in our churches remove the anchor of prophecy from from their um, uh, from their foundation the, so the Old Testament prophecies that, that are, mainly have Old been Testament fulfilled and, yeah but funnily enough even the prophecies in the New Testament are, are removed from the weekly teachings in the churches. Maybe it's because it's too controversial. Maybe it's because mm. people just don't want to go there. 
I, I think a lot of times too, uh, because I mean, one of the things that we like to do at Know My Faith is to uh, bring the scriptures from the historical cultural perspective so that we understand this. But if, as some d denominations have done, you remove that historical cultural perspective, the prophecy doesn't make sense anymore. No, but also it becomes just a fairy tale because yeah. it doesn't have anything to, to stand on. Uh, it's it's just some story that happened long long time ago in the land far 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 away yeah i mean uh, ezekiel in ezekiel god says talking about the the new covenant the new testament yeah he says i will make a new covenant with israel and judah yeah that's in jeremiah he, 31 yeah, oh, sorry jeremiah so he's talking literal israel and judah yes not spiritual but if you have removed literal israel and judah from your theology oh yeah how are you going to make sense of that prophecy yeah it's um it's a big issue um when you remove uh components yeah of the faith like like the people of israel who are uh, happen to be an anchor one of the anchors to to our contemporary faith. If you remove that, you know, if God is not faithful to Israel and um, and the fact that we still exist is is, yeah. uh, is a marvel because uh, it's, it's, we shouldn't it's, we shouldn't it's a miracle. Exist. Yeah, we shouldn't exist in the natural. You, you shouldn't have existed lots of times in the natural. <laughs> exactly. exactly. But I like um, Howard Bass, who who pastors in Besheva. Oh, yes. um, and he said with that passage from Jeremiah, and he says, well, so if God breaks this covenant with Israel, which he says, I won't break in, unless I break my covenant with day and night, he says, well, yeah. what happens to the people in New Zealand? You die. Same as, you know, if, if God is going to break those, then throw out all his covenants, throw out all his promises. Yeah, that's uh, definitely is uh, something that affects us. If God is not faithful to his promises to the Jewish people, what makes him uh, reliable to the promises he made to us. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's totally makes sense. And plus, uh, in that, we're not going to talk about that passage, but in that passage, it says to the house of Israel, to Judah. And um, I don't recall ever the church being called Judah. No. So, so that makes a big problem there. No, we didn't steal that one. We only stole the Israel one. <laughs> Um, so what we are going to look at, as we look at, uh, call it uh, Messiah in the Tanakh or Jesus in the Old Testament, uh, yes. let's look at Psalm 8. Totally. So um, just to give you a background, I think uh, in, the, um, in the context of uh, why this, this uh, passage came up, as a Bible study uh, is again one of those uh, moments where I was asked, "Well, you claim, uh, you claim, um, yeah, Messianic believer, you claim that Jesus was uh, born uh, divine." Okay, well, where is that in the Old Testament? Where is that incarnation um, to back it up? To yeah. back up that story in the New. And so one of those uh, passages, um, messianic, it's a messianic psalm, Psalm 8. And because, first of all, it's being repeated several times in the New Testament. So it talks about Jesus. It talks about mm -hmm. um, a hidden way, in a hidden way. So, so that's one of those, those um, really hidden hidden uh, uh, meanings of the, yeah. of the passage. That's, that's where the new is in the old concealed. It, it was always exactly. there. We just didn't see it. It was always there, but yeah, yeah you, it was very hard for us to spot it, especially if you don't know Hebrew. Yeah. You will get really tangled up with um, wrong interpretations. So shall I start and read a few verses and, uh, and then we can go from there? Yeah, by all means. All right. So Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, 
the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name, in all the earth that's uh, a beautiful psalm and uh, yeah. i just wanted to point out that the um, the structure of this psalm if you take it to our culture is structured like a hamburger right yeah you yeah the, or the, bookends we say <laughs> yeah but, but ha uh, hamburger yeah, hamburger yeah. is much better yeah you have the bun on the top you know the praising yeah. the lord in the beginning praising the lord at the end you have the lettuce and tomatoes and and the sauce yep. in the form of God's general creation and how he made the moon and the stars, the the babies that form in the mother's womb. Yeah. Um, later on, it talks about at the end of the psalm, just before the end, it talks about all the animal kingdom, those on the land, the birds in the air and the fish in the sea. So that's the beef patty in the middle or the fish patty in the middle? No, that's still the, the lettuce and tomato. Okay. Yeah. And now uh, when you look at the, um, basically verses, uh, the, ver the middle verses, that's yep. that's the patty. And if that's, you... That's, that's the meat of the of That's the, the meat. That's yeah. the men, mankind. We're talking about human beings. Yeah. Yeah. But... But yeah, well, I'll ask yeah. What you, what is man that you are mindful of him? Yeah, yeah that's the essence of of uh, or the middle part of this psalm. So the focus obviously falls on that portion. Yeah. You think about a, a hamburger. What's the most important part in the hamburger? Well, the meat, of course. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Especially if you're on keto. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, then yeah. meat is like really really important. So this. Um, this this beginning of the meat what is man that you're mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him this is repeated uh in the new testament totally and um i think what uh, what's really going on here is completely wrong translation uh in the english so much so that some some uh, english versions have have um added on to the meaning right. and uh, they they speak in plurality, meaning um, both both verses are well. The first. So, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Yeah, yeah. And, and that is and that is fine when it comes to that verse. But in the next verse, it would be completely wrong to translate it in plurality. That's uh, the um, you've made I him a little lower make them a little lower that that's that would be that would be wrong wrong completely yeah uh, and we'll get to that we'll we'll talk about it why and um you know when i also look at uh, different translations uh, or commentaries on that psalm um some of them are very very uh, prominent commentaries um, i find them to be completely wrong uh, i'll give you an example because they're lacking the historical cultural context and the language they and the language really get the language and and seeing it for what it is um this is a commentary by james montgomery boyce and he's a very uh respected commentator yep. of the book of psalms he died in 2000 he was a uh, uh, pastor of the 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and he was the president and co-founder of the Alliance of uh, Confessing Evang Evangelicals. Uh, so many actually uh, commentators, um, they rely on other commentators and rely on other commentators. Yeah. It, goes, it goes like no, hang on. The, the Jewish sages do the same, you know, as, as the Reb said, as, you know. True. And this is what he says about uh, verse uh, four and five. Yet that is what God does. And not only that, not only does God think 
of us and care for us, which is what verse four asserts, he also crowned us. See the plurality here? Crowned yeah. us with glory and honor. This means that he has given human beings mere specks in this vast universe, a significance and honor above everything else he has created. But, you know, if we, if we look at how God created mankind in the beginning and the fact that he's given mankind or men, first man, yeah. dominion over the animal kingdom, that would be true. But when it comes to this psalm, it actually falls very flat. It's not. I mean, the, the funny thing is, Zohar, that, that you should be able to understand that if you connect the psalm with Hebrews 2. Because Absolutely. in Hebrews 2, it's explained that that verse is talking about Messiah. The problem is that people tend to think that the author of Hebrews uh, went a little bit on a tangent or let, went too far. In, right. um, and they think that maybe both translations or interpretations can be valid. God should have picked that up and made that more clearer for us in the Bible, shouldn't he? <laughs> <laughs> he made it very clear. <laughs> anyway, let's look at um, verse 4. Yeah. Yep. Um, what does it say in your translation? It's uh, well, I've got the ESV up here, uh, yep. which is uh, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him. Excellent. So the Hebrew actually is a little bit different. By the way, the old King James and the new King James say something different. What is man that you mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? Yeah, and that's right. You, you suddenly get a whole different understanding. And what, what is I actually saying in Hebrew is that what is meant that you remember him, that, you, uh, that your mind is, is even considering him, in, another, in other words. Yeah. The son of man that you visit him in order to care. Now, in other words, it's not a polite type of visit when you go to a friend knocking on his door and say, hey, let's have a cuppa together. Yeah. It's a different kind of visitation. It's a visitation in order to assist, to aid in a time of trouble, in a time of need. Yeah. Um, James says that true religion is um, abstaining from polluting oneself with the things of the world and aiding, aiding orphans, the widows and orphans, orphans yeah. in their distress. The word there is the same word as here, lifkod, which means coming physically to the rescue. Yeah, doing something. I was just listening to C.S. Lewis, uh, Mere Christianity, when he talks about that with love. And it's the old saying, that love isn't a feeling, love is an action, it's a verb. So in here, uh, when it says the son of man, that you care for him, it's caring by coming and doing something for him. Yeah, and it actually has to be, in the Hebrew, it has to be a physical an action. Appearing, uh, appear, a physical oh, okay. visitation. Yeah. In order to aid, in order to assist. So, if, so for a even for a, a non-messianic Jew to read this, uh, a God-fearing Jew, yeah. this is saying, "Who is the Son of Man that you, God, would physically appear to him?" Yeah, that's actually what stems from this psalm. And uh, if if someone knows biblical Hebrew, knows the word lifkod, lifkod is actually coming to the rescue physically. I can see a few Jewish rabbis also kind of going a little bit off tangent with it in a commentary if we're talking about God physically coming to rescue man. Yeah, um, that that would basically be an oxymoron. Yeah. Because, um, in a sense, David, the psalmist, um, sees that, hey, um, you know, we shouldn't be on God's mind. He shouldn't remember us in the vast uh, universe in the way he created everything. We shouldn't be so significant at all. Yeah. As a matter of fact, if, you, if God is coming to visit us, uh, it shouldn't be right. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be paid a visit by God. Yeah. That's, that's, um, that's completely out of character. 
So this is this is even more than a rhetorical questions or two rhetorical questions. Yeah, it's completely uh, uncomprehensible uncom that God would come and actually care in order to visit yeah. and aid us physically. And yet it's also written as a um, an established fact and something that he has done. Yeah. And is doing. It's not like, oh, no, well, you wouldn't think of us. It's it's you did. You shouldn't have thought of us. How come you did? Yeah, and that actually um, ties very, very well with the story of Christmas because um, now people uh, have um, thought in the Christian circles about the birth of Jesus at this time of year. Of course, he didn't, he wasn't born at this time of year, but. Yeah. But this is what is generally celebrated his birth. I think that's the most important component of the gospel because people, uh, when they think about the gospel, they think about his death, his resurrection, ascension. But the fact is that he came to be one of us. Um, he, he became a human being. Yeah. He is, is the most astonishing part of the gospel because why would God do that? Why would yeah. God even care about us to become a human being like us? Uh, that's humiliating. Yeah. Man. Yeah. And <laughs> I mean, we could get so sidetracked on that, but, but it's the, the more you read the, the full scriptures and oh, the yeah. more you understand that it, it's just the more you just keep going. Wow. Oh yeah. So wow. the gospel, the gospel can't be divorced from the person of Yeshua, the person yeah. of Jesus, the Messiah. He is the gospel. He came to be a human being because if he wasn't a human being, all of that wouldn't be, um, ex the, the sacrifice wouldn't be acceptable to God. No. His blood would be an artificial one, wouldn't be a yeah. real one. Yeah. So he had to be, become a human being. So, in, so verse four, yeah. uh, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Is, is that the, the son of man, is that the same him in verse five when it says no. you've made him a little lower? No. no okay. So uh, verse four, we're talking about mankind. Right. Mm -hmm. So the son of man there is generally mankind. Yeah, because uh, usually when when in the hebrew the son of man or the way yeah. that jesus would have um relate to himself in the gospels yeah the son of man is ben ha adam like with the with the letter hey in, in ha. Of the yeah. word adam yeah but this is ben adam meaning uh. it's just human beings it's not ben ha adam in um talking about the son of man uh because in the english it does say the son of man. So that's where we miss that again. No, it's uh, my well, depending, depending on which translation you've got. In Hebrew, it's my nosh kitiskerenu u ben adam kitifkedenu, not ben ha adam. Yeah. It's ben adam. Let me ben look adam. it up in this other one of Don's. What's your translation, Don? New American. All right, let me, uh, New American. Psalm, somewhere near the middle, I think, isn't it? Yeah, Psalm 8. <laughs> In the middle of find the it rob psalm 8 verse four no, no, it says, so it says that here as well what is man that you take thought of him and the son of man so in english we've got the 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 in there maybe the, which, which the idea is there. the the human race but yeah it's yeah that's what it should be talking about it's not talking about the messiah it's yeah so you could make that mistake by not knowing the hebrew language in the original yeah yeah, yeah. Anyway, so because the verse four is so um, completely amazing uh, yeah. in its in its content and its understanding, it's so revolutionary that it needs a real good answer to what is going on here, what is happening, and if if it's true that the <laughs> the God of the universe is going to come for a visitation to visit us and to help us, then we have to understand how it's going to take place. And the question that 
um, that is asked immediately is how. How yeah. is it going to take place? So you would, uh, in the Hebrew, you would ask that. Gosh, we're stuck on one verse because in English, it's that's that's totally, totally, yeah, it's totally missing in the English because it simply uses that word that you would care for him. That, and caring for is like, um, I, I care for my guitar. Ways to care for someone. Yeah, but but it's like it's like for us, it's more like a feeling than an action. Oh, okay, okay. You know, so we totally miss the fact that there's the action. And again, this is uh, part of that whole Greek um, Hebrew mindset, where in in the Greek words mean thoughts and things, as opposed to in Hebrew, it's always tied in with an action. True, um, but it's more, it gets more revolutionary as we go along. <laughs> so let's move on to the next yeah. verse five, and it says in the English translation, in all English translations, basically it says, "Read yep. me." You have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. Excellent. Thank you. So the problem is. That uh, that um, that's a big mistranslation. Now you know Hebrew a little bit, don't you? Yeah. Okay, you, you probably know two words that I'm going to ask you. What okay. is the word for create? Creates. No, that's gone. Bereshit. Bereshit. Oh yes. Yeah. Bereshit bara bara. The word bara. bara. Create. Um, what is the word for made? Made is a different word. I know that. Asa. Asa. Basically, um, if you want to say God is made or God is created, you would use one of those two words. Right. The thing is, it doesn't. It's not appearing here at all in this uh, verse five. Oh, neither, neither of those words. Neither. Neither of those <laughs> words. <laughs> As a matter of fact, there is a word that is very interesting. It's called. Uh, it says "tachserehu." Tachserehu. You will make him lower you will basically the word is you will you have demoted him demoted demoted That's i love it too. when i was um i spent time with israel harrell yeah. uh when we were in israel and he would say he says get out your king james bible read me this verse and i'd read it to him and he'd go that's not what it says <laughs> yeah so it says you have demoted him to be lower in Hebrew than God, or gods, mm. and you've crowned him with glory and honor. So in other words, the demotion here can only mean that the person that was demoted was higher in rank before he was demoted. Yes. So that means it wasn't us. We're not talking about human beings anymore. No, because we were not higher. Exactly. We were created in the rank in the position where we are at now yeah right but that person and that's actually answering the question how god is going to come and visit us so put that put that in time order because what that what's that saying now is you've demoted him and the him here is singular yep yeah so you you demoted him yes. lower than the angels yes so the crowned him with glory and honor, is that in his demoted state or is that no, in... No, that's, a, that's the state. paradox. Um, that's the paradox part of the demotion and promotion, I would call it. Yeah. Because it runs through the entire scriptures. And when you look at um, different parts of the Messiah, Messiah, for example, if you... Uh, the most famous is Isaiah 53. Yeah. Right? But it starts in Isaiah 52, verse 13. It says, Behold, my servant or my slave will prosper. He will act wisely. He will be lifted up and highly exalted. How can a slave be high, lifted up and highly exalted like God is? Yeah. And that's, that, that's the paradox of the, the, the motion and promotion, the humiliation and exaltation. Yeah. And it runs which which God did through Joseph as well, as That's we right. well know. You know. That's right. Yeah. 
Uh, I better qualify too, because when I say, you know, with, with, with Israel saying that's not what it says, the, the English is correct, yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. <laughs> but the problem is that we have so many different meanings of the word made that's that right we, that we've taken the wrong meaning so the translators of the bible have done a good job but we just we just get the wrong well, meaning from it they did a good job in a sense that they used um what was available i guess to describe that the motion yeah uh, but um i would use a different word i would use the word diminish or demote or yeah. to make it very clear what what's taking place here and some some uh, translations like the NIV, if you take it, um, you'll see that it's talking. It's translated to say that he have made us, meaning all human beings, yeah. a little lower than the angels, and so um, so they actually done a very bad job in the translating. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but even the commentaries don't pick up on that. And, yeah. Uh, so there's a huge time frame in this verse five from the from the demotion of making him a little lower than the heavenly beings and to then the crowning. eventual crowning him with yes. glory and honor. Which is is that is that uh, implied in the Hebrew language, or is that again is that missing? Yeah, we only know that because of hindsight. Um, the way it says um, it's. The way it's written, it's supposed to shock us. It's supposed to bring us to a place of being puzzled. What's going on here? And that means that we have to notice and take real careful examination of what this this passage is saying. For Jewish people, if you have um, such a polar opposite descriptions, yeah. uh, you have to you are forced to take notice of that. Yeah, so, so so what you should do is you go from the any time it goes that doesn't make sense, mm -hmm. you need to dig deeper. Yeah. Um, also, there is a conjunction uh, of the word ve, meaning and, and mm -hmm. uh, that conjunction speaks of or can speak of a gap in, in time. All right. As well. So, um, so as a result, he would put everything under his feet, um, all under his control. Yeah. So that's that. We could have possibly whoever put the verse numbers in there could possibly have split, started verse six halfway through verse five because the the crowned him with glory and honor. You've given him dominion over the works of your that's hands. Right. You've put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and and, and all of that. That's yeah. Yeah, that's all together. totally. It's totally um, fit to do that. Also, we have to go to the New Testament to verify that what we're saying is true. Yeah. Right? So we'll go to Hebrews chapter two. Um, you might have it on your um, on the screen for us. Uh, I've got I've got it here. We'll okay. just hope that those watching have got their Bibles. All right. So you want to read that from chapter 2, verses 5 through to 9? Yeah, please do. All right. I have the Hebrew. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection, under his feet. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we don't yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him, Jesus obviously, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. Mm -hmm. So you see that that, that idea is permeates through the author of Hebrews actually nailed it. It didn't go on a tangent. It didn't misinterpret yeah. it. It didn't go beyond the the common interpretation. Actually, he nailed it exactly what the scriptures are telling us in the, yeah. in the original Hebrew. And um, yeah. and where it says you made him for a little while lower than the angels. That's that's that, right. that's, the, 
that's a demotion you've, you've thing. demoted him yeah. in order to later on promote him so it, most of the new testament writers uh in quoting the scriptures they quoted the septuagint true yeah true so, and, and what a lot of people don't understand with it is when you've got the, the 70 scholars who are translating the Hebrew uh, and where the words are very specific mm -hmm. into Greek, where also the words are very specific, yeah. um, as opposed to English, where the words are just whatever, you know, yeah. but they chose specific words to say that. So the, the authors of the, or the translators of the Septuagint put in that you made him for a little while lower than the angels to re-emphasize that yeah um so yeah the authors of the septuagint or the translators um uh, carry a lot they carry a lot of weight because they translated it very early on into greek before jesus was born mm. they didn't have any um any reason to be not objectives uh, not object this not. is this is two 200 years before jesus That's was right. born is when the septuagint so there's no messianic uh, influence in the translation and also if back then they would understand certain words to mean certain things we have to take note of it because over the years we could have lost the understanding of what that word actually meant to them in that time during that period so yeah. it would be very important actually to notice and uh, take um, take real real yeah, it, if we're not sure what the hebrew word really means let's look at the greek word that was used in the septuagint that's right because that's got to give us a clue and it takes us way back before, yeah. you know back in time when they, they they've done that so the the writer of hebrews just he he says right here that this verse is talking about jesus that's right. And it couldn't possibly be talking about anybody else because he's the only one that was highly exalted, yeah. demoted, put down, and then highly exalted again. And then lifted up again. Yeah. Who could it um, possibly be? Other yeah, than and, and, and right at the end of uh, verse 9, you know, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. So that doesn't mean all of mankind. That's right. Uh, also, if you if you look at Philippians chapter two, uh, starting from verse five or six, you yeah, I mean that's that's another passage that we just we don't understand there because it talks about um, didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped, and and that's yeah. one of those ones you just go, oh, that's too hard for me to think about. I'll just. Yeah. <laughs> well, the thing is, you you have to understand how the gospel. Uh, the, the good news um, starts. It starts off with God choosing to be demoted, to be humiliated, to become a human being. Um, yeah. And suffering humiliation from um, other mere human beings. Yeah. It's not only them, but also from God himself. Um the fact that he was willing to become a human being to be humiliated is an astounding truth of the gospel that we seldomly think that that's where the gospel starts it doesn't start on the cross it doesn't start when he was resurrected it started of his incarnation this is the main important part of the gospel that he chose to become one of us one of the human beings to say. i think it starts even way before that because you know you read um twice in um in the new testament particularly in revelation it talks about the lamb slain from the foundation of the world um it was always god's plan to come True. and die for us that would be the, the, the gospel started in the mind of god before he created the universe it was foretold it was foretold here yeah. in Psalm eight it's a it's a prophecy about the incarnation yeah that will take place in the future sometime in the future so many people teach and and i've heard people say it but you know that, that um the cross was god having to fix the fact that we'd sinned 
like when Adam sinned and God goes, oh my goodness, that's destroyed my perfect creation. What am I going to do? Oh, I know, I'll come down. You know, when you look at the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, that doesn't make sense. He was always going to come in the incarnation of a human being. Yes, because once God gave human beings um, the ability to accept him or to reject him, to, to have sovereignty over their choosing, um, in that, as soon as he, he enabled us to, to have a relationship with him, meaning he created us in a place where we might have a relationship with him, that means that we could reject that yeah. uh, God or we could accept him. Um, yeah. As soon as we had the ability to reject God, uh, God already had to set in place a plan for, for what was coming. Um, as yeah. soon as the human, as, as human beings, you know, if you ask yourself, why is there evil in the world? Did God create evil? Did God made evil possible? Um, and the, the, question, the question is answered by the fact that he created human beings with the ability to choose to have a relationship with God or to reject God. Yeah. As soon as you reject God, as soon, because God is the only source of goodness in this world, guess what? There will be evil. Yeah, the bad, the bad stuff starts to happen. Yeah, you One can't have, thing, a relationship, have a relationship yeah. with, uh, with a robot. No, you know? you no, got, we have to have free it. will. The, yeah. We, we'll get wild, well, he's sidetracked here. Let's not do that. Okay. Um, <laughs> This is fat. This is the. This is something that I love doing when I sit down with the likes of you and, and with others. Is that you just, you can spend hours just getting sidetracked in the gospels and sidetracked with God. There is in these verses in Psalm eight. Uh, there's that time factor, that gap in the middle between the demoting and the exalting. And Philippians talks about this as well. You know, let's, that, let's read it, Philippians because it's really important yeah. to add on. So. So Philippians 2, 5 to 9, uh, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped or held on to, but That's emptied right. himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and mm -hmm. being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Yes, yes, that's yeah. that's not a new idea. That's that's not. You, we have to understand. Uh, Paul is not coming up with something completely new. He was actually already um, repeating the things, the ideas that came through the Old Testament. Yeah. Many many times you have that paradox of of um, humiliation, exaltation. You know, and he uses here what you mentioned before, the servant found in Isaiah. He specifically that's mentions right. the word servant. That's right. That's that's uh, also that servant is going to be highly exalted. And yeah. the fact that there is a gap between his humiliation and his exaltation, remember, those are prophecies. Yeah. Those are prophecies in the Old Testament that, that points to that time of, um, you know, ele um, very significant points in time. Yeah where there's a, a significant point in time of his humiliation and then a, another significant point in time with his exaltation. Yeah. The, I mean, the, we, we miss that so much, but it's, I mean, God puts it there for us in black and white in the scriptures. We mentioned Joseph before from the dreams right. of being charged. He went through all of that into the prison and everything. Um, David, very similar. He's anointed yes. king by Samuel. And what is it? 15 years? 20 years later. 20 years later. He was actually crowned as king of Israel. That's a Judah. long time to wait. Man, I, uh, I thought about it. You know, it's, it's actually very, um, very significant for us to learn from that, to actually be patient until God gives us, uh, delivers to us on the silver plate that which God has promised. You know, if we yep. think about David, he was able to grab 
that which God has promised him by force. Yeah. And remember that in that cave he, where he, he could have done. You could have in that cave cut the when he cut the the, the rope. Saul's robe. He could have killed yeah. Saul. Yeah, and then yeah, he could, totally he could have let his mate do it another time. Yeah. And he could have totally grabbed the kingdom that was rightfully his, right? But, but he was know, patient he and he waited. Yeah, that's why the book of Hebrews says, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. Yeah. Meaning Yeshua, Jesus, is waiting patiently for God to deliver the kingdom into his hands and not going out and grabbing it. You know, in the, in the desert when he was tempted by the devil, he, said, he showed him all the yeah. kingdoms. He said, I'll give it to you, bow down. You can avoid the cross. You can avoid the pay, the, the need to be the paid. humiliation. Here, here it is. It's rightfully yours, you know. Come. No, yeah. he, he, was, he was patient. Yeah. Uh, it's just us. We also could decide, hey, this is rightfully mine. I'm going to go and grab it. Uh, and God is teaching us. The... the the nation of Israel going through the wilderness, their complaints to Moses were, you know, God's brought us out here to kill us. Um, you know, and it's like God says, I am going to take you to the land of milk and honey. That's right. That's my promise. And mm -hmm. what you are saying now is that I'm a liar. Yep. They weren't it, patient enough to wait. Yeah. For God to fulfill that which He had promised. Yeah, and uh, I mean that's talked about too in Second uh, Peter. Yeah, people that you know the people exactly. go, oh, where's, where, where's the second where's the coming of your of Messiah? Yeah. yeah, where's the promise of His coming? Since the days uh, of when the fathers fell asleep, everything is going the same way. Yep. Yeah. So actually, that's our our sin as as a Jewish as a nation. At the time when the visitation actually took place, right? Yeah. There was already um, a sin of um, not being patient for God to fulfill that which he promised. We, we gave up the hope of the Messiah coming and we already started. Um, now yeah. I want you to notice this. We already started building the kingdom ourselves because herod had rebuilt the temple herod rebuilt the temple yeah our systems were all um oiled and smooth we had our systems we had our sanhedrin they decided everything um everything went smoothly people knew how much tax to pay what they do in the temple which animals to bring Messiah. You gotta be careful. You know, look, you be careful there, Zohar. That's uh, starting to sound like kingdom now theology. Oh, that's totally was what was had taking place. Look, uh, yeah. One of the reasons why Jesus was rejected, why Yeshua was rejected, is because he was not um, one of them. He wasn't a Pharisee. He wasn't a Sadducee. And yeah. they tried to make him one. They tried to fit him in. And they had to reject him altogether because he wouldn't fit into their systems, into their kingdom. Oh dear! Let's hope that doesn't happen with the church. Oh, it with the second coming. The church. Like, there's there's oh, so exactly there's so the much church. in there. I mean, I was I was just talking to somebody the other day. Uh, even with the Maccabees around the time of Hanukkah, yeah. um, the the Hellenization of the Jewish people. They're trying to yeah. be like the world around this point. This is when Messiah came. Here's the nation of Israel trying to bring about the kingdom themselves. This is when Messiah came and they missed it. You look at the parallels with the church today, which is very Hellenized, very, very worldly. So many people trying to bring about kingdom. Now let's make the world perfect for Jesus when he comes back. Uh, oh, I'm thinking they're not reading. It's, it's again, it's, it's the, those verses from Second Peter, you know um scoffers will come and say where is the yep. promise of his coming what is the church teaching um some of the church contemporary churches teachings is like this is what i heard myself heaven is what you make of it here on earth and hell yep. is also what you make of it here on earth oh my goodness me 
There is no faith in waiting for God to fulfill the His promises. How do you get that from reading this? Well, there's you, a you lot. You can't. Of, there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of confusion. The um, the verse that, and let's just finish with this. Um, Jesus in Luke 19, yes. when he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, which we yes. know happened in 70 AD. Uh, and he says, this is going to happen to you. And the words are, because you did not know the time of your visitation. Your visitation. Um, yeah. a, 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 implied in that is the fact that you rejected the Messiah. You should have been looking like, uh, when we look at the Christmas story, Anna and uh, Simeon, Simeon in the temple, we should have, you should have been looking. All the signs were there. Exactly. The reason why Simeon and Anna are there, because they stand up like a sore thumb in relation to the, their generation. Where, while they were waiting patiently, coming to a very old age, not giving up. Yeah. And yet the rest of the population, uh, the leaders especially, we're talking about, they just gave up the idea of the visitation. Yeah. They weren't waiting patiently. In they, the... they did not know the time. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. it's, it's, and what are we doing? <laughs> exactly. that, that, that's the implied exactly. question, isn't it? Exactly. So if we go right back to Psalm 8. Yes. And again, the, the bookmarks or the, or the buns on the burger. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth um we got to look at, at god being god god who brings prophecies and fulfills those prophecies no matter how long the gap is yes, I, I, I remember i remember one time god had promised me um long before i met sharon that he had this special woman put aside and i remember standing outside my flat in christchurch one time complaining about the fact that that he hadn't brought her yet and i said i said god that woman that you have for me um can I have her? And basically, I mean, to cut it short, he goes, do, do you want her now or when I think it's best? <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is, of course, when he thinks it's best. But we need to be looking for him. Yeah. And we need to be knowing our scriptures. And thank you so much for taking us to, into Psalm 8, um, because we need to know what the scriptures say in the original Hebrew as opposed to just our English. We need to dig deeper to understand that historical, cultural context of our faith absolutely and you know the glory goes to god in in that psalm you know uh, how majestic is your name in all the earth yeah you know thinking about the fact that he was willing to humble himself yeah to demote the motion you know we all want promotion we never want the motion yeah you know? but he was willing to go through that humility and that, and, and that just glorifies him even more Totally. Like, what? Why would we be so um, worthy of his visitation? Yeah, yeah. Zohar, thank you so much for your time. It's been great talking with oh, you. Oh, bless you. Thank you very much for this time. Excellent. Zohar Gonan, who is a speaker with Celebrate Messiah New Zealand, and he's available for you if you want to invite him uh, to come around and speak in your home groups or churches or wherever. Uh, you can get a hold of Zohar through Celebrate Messiah. Thanks for joining us on our Know My Faith Monday podcast. See you next time.